Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. I'll read that portion and we'll get into our study. Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 17. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness saw a great light. And upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's a blessing that we actually have four Gospels. Because if we only had this one gospel, we would actually be losing out on an entire year of ministry that John in his gospel records for us. See, what we have in Matthew is we have in chapter, uh, in chapter 4, we have uh, the Lord Jesus Christ going through the temptation. In chapter 3, it gives to us his baptism. But when you get to verse 11 and then move into verse 12, there's actually about a year that transpires in the ministry of Jesus that Matthew didn't, uh, was not led by the Holy Spirit to record for us, but that John actually recorded, and you can see that if you're interested by simply reading chapter 1 through 4 in the Gospel of John. And when you look at the Gospel of John, you see that Jesus was very busy in ministry. <laughs> there we go after the temptation, because in his temptation, after his temptation, John records that, uh, well, that John the Baptist made a declaration that Jesus is the Son of God, and then Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel began to follow Jesus, that Jesus' first miracle occurred at Cana of Galilee. He records the first cleansing of the temple and a conversation that Jesus had with a man by the name of Nicodemus. He also records the final testimony of John the Baptist as well as ministry that Jesus performs in Samaria to the woman at the well and many other Samaritans. All of that is left out of Matthew's gospel. So what we have with Matthew is we have verse 11 when it speaks of the devil leaving him and angels coming and ministering to him. And then you have verse 13. So in verse 13, Matthew now picks up his account and wants to continue communicating to us that that. God is doing his work through his son, Jesus Christ. Now notice how it begins in verse 12. It says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And so what that is for us is uh, it's a time of the events uh, so that we can know what's going on. It says that this is when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison. Now, it's interesting how John, rather Matthew, uses the time of John's imprisonment for the start of Jesus' ministry. Someone said the conclusion of the herald's work signaled the beginning of the kings. And so John has been put in prison. He's been imprisoned for his faithfulness to his call. And I want to talk about that with you for a moment as we develop an, an introduction to our study. You see, John has been imprisoned because he was faithful to the calling God gave to him. Remember in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, how that Matthew says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so John had a ministry of repentance. And in the ministry of preaching repentance, we need to understand something about that. That ministry of preaching repentance is not just to, just to a single group of people. It's to all people. And that all would include those who are poor, and those who were in the highest political offices. Everybody was called to do the same thing, whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you are powerful, or whether you are weak. We were all called to do the same thing, and John's, John was faithful to the proclamation of this message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, he had been imprisoned for doing so. You see, the message included this politician named Herod. 
And Luke records in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, Herod the Tetrarch being rebuked by him concerning Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, also added this, above all, that he shut John up in prison. What had happened is John, in his proclamation of repentance, included a direct rebuke to this politician by the name of Herod. Herod had gone to Rome, and while Herod was in Rome, he made a connection with Herodias. Herodias was his brother Philip's wife. And so Herod literally stole Herodias from his own brother, but at the same time was married to another woman. And so what he did is he forced divorces to occur. And according to Scripture, you find that in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 14, what he did was commit the sin of adultery. And the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. John, being aware of what he did, came and preached and said, it is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife. It was his responsibility as a prophet of God to speak the truth courageously and with conviction, regardless of the outcome. And that's what he did. You see, living a righteous life and speaking out against unrighteousness is costly. It isn't an easy thing to do, to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, this is what we're to do. And there are tons of people who resent the fact that you will actually share with them that they need to get right with the Lord and that there are elements of their life that are, are simply not pleasing to God. And when you stand up and you actually will say to somebody, but this is what God's word says, you shouldn't be living with your girlfriend or your boyfriend. That's called fornication. People get upset. When you stand up and say, listen, I understand that you've made a choice in your lifestyle, but the lifestyle choices you're making are harmful to you for eternity. People get upset. They don't want to hear that. And if you speak that to somebody in power, they may find a way to harm you. And in the case of John, he spoke that to a man in power. This man's name was Herod, and Herod got upset over that. But John knew that with the preaching of righteousness would come a reaction. And very often it's a reaction of rejection and persecution. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. In John 15, 19, Jesus said it like this. He said, If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore, he said, the world hates you. People don't like hearing that there's something wrong in their life. They don't necessarily shake your hand and congratulate you for saying that to them. Sometimes they get upset. Sometimes they get angry at you because they come under what is called conviction. And they're upset. Sometimes conviction is painful. And it's difficult. And when you experience it, it isn't something that you want. It's not something that you like hearing. And you can have a response to it. It can be painful. I've shared this with you before in a different way, but some of you will recognize this once I continue and share this. But when I was 14 years old, how do you put it? When I was 14 years old, I got stabbed. I got stabbed in the abdomen. Right here, I still have a scar in my lower abdomen on the right side. I got stabbed. And I have to tell you, that's not a pleasant thing. To have somebody put something in you and slice you, that is not a pleasant thing. And the thing that's even more bothersome about that is my mom was there and did nothing to stop it. You see, the one who stabbed me was a surgeon. Gotcha. I had a bad appendix. My mom took me to the doctor. The doctor diagnosed it, took me to the hospital. And the surgeon plunged a scalpel inside of me and sliced me open and removed an appendix that was close to bursting. That had it burst, could have infected my body to the point of even taking my life. It was not a pleasing thing to have my body sliced open. It was not a pleasing thing to have them remove that appendix, but it is a pleasing thing to know that it saved my life.
Conviction sometimes is like a plunging of the Holy Spirit's scalpel into the soul of man, but it removes the decay and the death that is destroying that person's life. And when you love somebody, you love them enough to tell them the truth. That's why Paul said, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth. You see, God has called us to do that, and John did that. And when John preached the truth, he went from not only the person who was on the street, but he also spoke that same message to a politician named Herod. It is not lawful, he would say to him. And, and just the thought of the, the courage and, and, and a, a courageous way that this man spoke, it is not lawful for you to have your brother Philip's wife, is what he said. And Herod did not like it, and neither did Herodias. So sometimes... Taking a stand for righteousness will cost you more than freedom. It cost John more than his freedom. It ultimately cost John his life. But that's what righteousness demands, is for you to speak the truth. And so as John has been faithful to his calling, calling people to repentance, he's been arrested for doing it. He's been arrested for doing what he was called to do. There is a price that you pay when you preach the truth. But what was Jesus' response? Well, notice it says in verse 12 again, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, his response, he departed to Galilee. So he withdrew himself from the south, from Judea, went to the north, which is a region there that is called Galilee. Now, John chapter 4 informs us that, uh, that they knew that Jesus was having a greater impact on the people than John. In John chapter 4, verses 1 and 3, it says, The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, Jesus is not reluctant to confront them any more than John was reluctant to preach the truth. You see, eventually Jesus had many confrontations with the Pharisees, and he never minced his words with them. When you read your New Testament, and especially the Gospels, and you see Jesus as he's speaking to the Pharisees, well, very often he had some very scathing words for Pharisees. It's interesting how that he speaks with a gentleness and a love in a way that's very open to those who were in sin. He spoke in that way to those who needed him, but to those who were the religious leaders, he had some strong words. All you need to do is read Matthew chapter 23, for example, and you'll see this. Because in Matthew chapter 23, this is how he spoke to them. He said to them that they were hypocrites. He said, you are children of hell. He said, you are blind guides. He said, you are fools. You are serpents. You are a brood of vipers. And so Jesus spoke very strongly to these people. Well, you think of Jesus and you think of him as Jesus meek and mild, but Jesus Christ was straightforward. And, and so he would say these things, but at this time it just wasn't, it wasn't the moment that he had to deal with them. And so what he does is he, he leaves the south and he goes to the north to minister there. Now in leaving for Galilee, he's going to continue to expand his ministry. And so in verse 13, continuing, it says, Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet saying, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light. And upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death, light has dawned. And so Jesus has gone from the south. It's called Judah or Judea. He's gone to the north. He's passed through Samaria into a region of the north by the Sea of Galilee that is called uh, is called Galilee, but it's referred to in verse 15 as the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. Zebulun and Naphtali were two of the 12 tribes of Israel who received an allotment of their land that they were given as the 12 tribes because the, the promised land was divided into 12 sections for tribes. One section, well, and one tribe, the tribe of Levi, didn't receive any land because their allotment was the Lord. And so when you look at a map, it's actually divided into 12 segments. And I have a, a picture just to give you an idea of what it is that we can show here on the uh, screen here. And if they'll turn it on other than seeing me looking up at the stars. <laughs> Shadow puppets. And, his... and the Holy Spirit came. 
I guess we don't have, oh, there it is. Okay, if you look to the top there, you see uh, Naphtali, Zebulun, Issachar, Asher. That's the general region. And off to the east in that area is the Sea of Galilee. And so that's what's being referred to here in this passage here. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. Jesus went from the south, went up to the north. And so he, dw he dwells in a city called Capernaum. Now, Jesus had uh, lived in a city called Nazareth, but he now leaves and makes his ministry headquarters in this place called Capernaum. Why did he leave Nazareth? Well, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that he had been rejected there. You see, Jesus had preached in a synagogue. He had read the scriptures and said, this that I'm uh, reading to you that was written by Isaiah has been fulfilled in me. And when he did that, the people in the synagogue were greatly upset with him and took him to the brow of the hill that is there in the city of Nazareth and tried to push him down to kill him. So they flat out rejected him. So he left Nazareth and he moved now to the city of, of uh, Capernaum. Now the region, as mentioned, the region of Zebulun and Naphtali speaks of a portion of land that was divided to the two tribes. It's there in the Galilee. It's a land that is around 60 miles from the north to the south, 30 miles from the east to the west, it contained the Sea of Galilee. It was heavily populated during the time of Christ. About two million people lived there. And it's called the Way of the Sea, and you'll see that in verse uh, 15, the Way of the Sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. It's called the Way of the Sea because there was a road that went from the Mediterranean all the way uh, into Damascus. And so it was away from the Sea of, uh, from the Mediterranean Ocean. It would take them all the way into Damascus. So it's called the Way of the Sea. Now... The people who lived there, let me give you some insight into this because I'm going to develop, develop this with you. The people who lived there were not pure Jews. They were actually what would be called a hybrid race. One commentator used the word mongrel, and that's not a proper way to say it, but that was from a guy who was writing from many years ago, and that's how they would speak at that time. But it was a hybrid race. It was made up of Jew and Gentile. And during the time of Christ, there were more Gentiles there than the Jews. And so it had been basically overrun and populated by Gentiles. So to the Jews in the south, Galilee would be a region that was, at least to them, Gentile. But Isaiah had prophesied that they would hear this message and this mixed multitude would come to faith in, in, in the Lord. But I want to develop this with you now. I want to make application. Notice verse 16, how it says, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. I want to talk to you about that for a moment. When it says they sat in darkness, they were in a region of uh, the shadow of death. Sitting in darkness is, is one of the ways that the Bible speaks concerning being spiritually blind. And let me develop this with you for a moment. You can go to church from the time that you're small. You might have been in the, in, in the nursery. You went through Sunday school all your life. And then you got older and you went to what the kids here, they'll say big church, coming with the older people. There's a, a time that you may have matured to come into the church with the adults. So from the time that you were small all the way to the time that you become a young adult, you were raised hearing things about God. But that doesn't mean anything if you don't embrace them by faith. That doesn't mean anything if you haven't by faith received Christ as Lord and Savior. You're still seated in darkness. As a matter of fact, you're inoculating yourself from the truth and you're in a dangerous position because you're not responding to what the truth is. And what happens is your heart gets hardened because you think in terms of gaining information being a spiritual transformation. And that's why a lot of people say, well, I don't know. I've heard the gospel all my life. I believed it as a kid. I don't believe it now. It doesn't make sense to me now. No, you, you heard it as a child, but never embraced it by faith as a child. You never were born again. You were seated in darkness then, and you're, you're still in darkness now. I was raised not in a religious home. I but I did have religious instruction. As a child, I, I was taken to um, 
to a small church in Los Angeles. I was baptized in December of 1950 when I was a few months old. When I was around seven or so, I started going to catechism classes, received my communion. When I was 12, I received my confirmation. So I was raised learning certain basic principles, theologic principles, to the point where I could actually argue with people concerning religious things because I was raised in such a way that I had been inculcated with some of these things. So I could talk about God. I could talk about some things related to heaven and hell. I could, I, if you asked me at that time, do you believe in God? I'd say, yes. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I'd say, yes. If you said, who is he? I'd say, the second person of the most holy trinity. If you said, do you believe in the virgin birth? I would have said, yes. Do you believe in heaven? Yes. I would answer yes to all your questions. I firmly believed myself to be a Christian, but I was in darkness. I argued with people who would present their case to me about Christianity. I would argue with them. When somebody spoke to me at a tasty freeze across the street from Sierra High School there in Whittier, he walks up to me and he says to me, I want to share with you about Jesus Christ. And I said, where do you get your information about God and Jesus Christ? He said, from the Bible. And I said, how do you know the Bible is God's word? How do you know that? And he says to me, because I have faith. And I said, well, my faith tells me now that, that 12 men uh, who were loaded on acid wrote this book. Can you disprove that? So I got kind of hostile, but I had been raised in those things. As a matter of fact, even, even at that time when I was uh, just about, you know, the same time when I argued with this Christian guy who was trying to present Jesus to me, my cousin Carlos, who was raised in Jehovah's Witnesses, and he was my age, so we hung around growing up, and he only lived a few blocks away. I can still remember he, would, he was sitting with me as we were smoking pot, arguing about God. And he was arguing the Jehovah's Witness position, and I was arguing the Catholic position as we were getting high with one another, sharing a joint. And I told him, you're wrong, man. What kind of religious do you, thing do you believe in? That's how it was. And I did not see myself as a hypocrite. I didn't. I saw myself as a lapsed Catholic. At that one of these days, I'm going to get right. I'm going to outgrow my alcohol. I'm going to outgrow the drugs. I'm going to meet a nice Catholic girl, and, and she's going to pray my soul out of purgatory. That's, that was my hope of heaven. True story. And so that's what I thought. That was where my life was headed. I was going to be like my dad. My dad didn't go to church. My dad didn't go to church, but mom would go to church and she would take the kids to church. And so I was going to be like my dad. I was going to mow the lawn, drink a beer on Sunday. They'd go to church. I'd have a good wife, a good family, because it's all going to work out because that's how it works out. That was what I believed. And so if you would speak to me at the age of 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, and you would tell me about Jesus Christ, I would talk to you, I would be polite, sometimes I'd be a little straightforward, I might argue a bit, but I would listen to you. But I'd say, I am a Christian, I already am a Christian. I've been baptized, I've, been, I've, been, I've received communion, I've been confirmed, I am a Christian. I'm just not practicing my faith, but I will when I get married. And that means I was sitting in darkness, because I was not illuminated by the Spirit of God. I wasn't born again. These, these people that are being spoken of are spiritually blind. In Proverbs 4.19, it says, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. They are spiritually blind, and they need the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And so the light has to dawn on them. How is the light going to dawn on them? Because it says... The people who sat in darkness saw a great light upon those who sat in the region in shadow of death. Light has dawned. How did they get a chance to see this light? Verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Preaching. The Bible says in Luke 19.10 that Jesus came to set people free. He said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so Jesus began to preach. The word preach means to proclaim or to publish. 
to openly and publicly make known a message. And what Jesus did is he preached. Preaching is the proclamation of certainties, not the suggestion of possibilities. It is not a message that is voted on. It is a message that is to be acted on. Gospel preaching is not reasoning and it's not disputing. It's simply presenting God's truth. And Jesus preached, and his message was preached with conviction, and his message was preached with certainty. In Matthew 7, 29, says he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Concerning his message, Jesus said, I speak the things which I have seen with my Father. In John 12, 49, he said, I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Jesus spoke and preached with authority because Jesus was on a mission. And the best messages and the best ministry that is ever going on is when the ministers of the gospel, including you, are taking that word of God out and proclaiming it with certainty. This is the word of God, the very word of God that God has given to us, instructing us how to live and what to do that he might bless us. Yesterday, December 27th, I celebrated my 44th anniversary of coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I'm now 44 years old in Jesus Christ. And, and, and I was 20 years old. Thank you. I was 20, 20 years old. 20 years old when I gave my heart to Christ. A hippie, a druggy, alcoholic, barefooted, snotty-nosed little punk. That's what I was. Filled with anger, filled with hatred, filled with rejection of authority, a rejection of my parents, a rejection of my family, a rejection of all who loved me, somebody who could not have a dating relationship with anybody without destroying that relationship because I was so filled with myself, filled with my own needs, my own wants, Arrested three times, all alcohol-related arrests, drunk in public, burglarizing a jewelry store, running my car into a lamp post, put in jail, taken to a psychologist. My dad took me to a psychologist to try and uh, figure out what's wrong with my son. And nothing he did, nothing my parents did, changed me at all. I remember dropping five reds, barbiturates, and drinking a half gallon of wine with a friend, two friends of mine, three friends of mine. We drank about a quart of that half gallon, went off for a while, I came back and killed the rest of it. And I remember climbing in the back of my car, I had a 1962 Ford Falcon station wagon with a bed in it. And I used to just crash when I was too loaded to drive anymore, too drunk to drive. I would just pull over and sleep in the car, sleep it off, and the next morning just drive wherever it was that I was going. And I remember being in the back of that, laying under the blankets there. And I remember I was on my back and I was looking towards the headliner when my body began to want to regurgitate, to vomit, because I was suffering with uh, barbiturate poisoning. I knew a guy named Freddie Reyes, a young guy around my age, who had died of a barbiturate overdose. And I knew what the symptoms were, and I knew that I was dying. And I still remember at that age of calling out, and I didn't even pray, I hadn't prayed for so long, but I opened up my mouth, and I remember crying out, God help me. Don't let me die, I'm too young. And then I passed out. The next morning I woke up, I found the empty bottle. I threw it in the field next door and I got even worse. In, in the last month before I gave my heart to Christ, I went from 183 pounds to 145 pounds because I wasn't eating, I was just drinking, smoking dope and just living that life. And that's where I was at on December 20th. When my friend Bill took me to a place called the Hollywood Palladium. And I heard the gospel. I'd already been introduced to one message of the gospel. It was in 
the summer of 1970, I had attended this small church in Costa Mesa called Calvary Chapel. They preached the message about salvation through Christ, and I rejected it because I already was a Christian. I just wasn't living my Christian life, I said. But there I am, December 27, 1970, seated with thousands of young people, and this guy by the name of Arthur Blessed gets up, and he begins to preach a message. And as he's preaching about Jesus, I'm listening carefully. And as I'm listening, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes upon me, and I, I remember thinking, man, no. And a voice spoke to my heart to this day. It was a, a, an audible internal voice. It was a voice asking me a question, and the voice said to me, you're uncomfortable, aren't you? And I, without any reservation or hesitation, I spoke within myself, and I said, I'm very uncomfortable. And the voice said, why are you uncomfortable? And I said in response, because I'm not like these people. I'm not like these people. You see, they'd been standing and singing. They'd been worshiping and hugging each other. They'd been doing things that I was very uncomfortable with, holding hands and praying and things that I just wasn't comfortable with. And so I said, I'm not like these people. And the voice spoke to me again and said, what's the difference between you and them? And for the very first time in my life, and I thought I was just speaking to myself, for the very first time in my life I admitted, within I said, I'm not a Christian. Up to that day, if you would have asked me, are you a Christian, I would have argued hammer and tongue with you that I was. Yes, I'm a Christian. How dare you judge me and say I'm not. I've been baptized. I've done communion. I've been confirmed. I am a Christian. I would have fought with you. I would have argued with you. That was the very first time in my young life that I admitted, and I thought it was to myself, even to myself, that I was not a believer. I am not a Christian. What makes you different from these people? Why are you uncomfortable? Because I'm not like them. What's the difference? I am not a Christian. Arthur Blessed gives an invitation a few minutes later. If you're not a believer in Christ, I, I ask you, stand to your feet. There were, I, I, I think there were three, 4,000 people in this room, we were all these hippies sitting on the carpet. And I prayed again. I said, I can't. I, I remember saying this, God, I, I need you, but I am shy. I can't stand in front of people. You know that. But if somebody would stand with me, I would stand. As God is my witness, as God is my witness, when I said I would stand if someone stood with me, Arthur Blessed said, perhaps you're afraid to stand by yourself, but if somebody stood with you, would you stand? And my friend George Adams tapped me on the shoulder. He just wrote me two days ago, anniversary greetings and wishes. He tapped me on the shoulder and he said, I'll stand with you. And December 27, 1970, I stood for Jesus Christ and I've been standing for 44 years, 44 years. I stood for him, and I stand for him to this day. Preach the word with conviction and authority. It is the word of God. We ministers have to avoid the temptation to try to tickle the ears of the hearer so that we will have nickels and numbers in our congregation. A lot of pastors are afraid to preach the truth, but we have been called by God to preach the word of God because it's the word of God that sets the captive free. And that's why Jesus preached it. And it's not popular. And it's not popular, that is the truth. It is not popular, but it's the only message God gave to us. It's the only one. And every pastor needs to preach the truth. And if they don't, they ought to get out of the pulpit, move out of the way so a man of God can occupy it and tell the people the truth. Because that's what sets them free. That's what sets them free. 
and Jesus spoke with conviction and he spoke with authority. I don't, I'm no theologian, but I do know this. God's word is true. And Jesus said the truth will make you free. And I stand as a 44-year testimony that truth sets you free. Jesus Christ will set you free. And that's what he did when he came and died on that cross. And that's why we need to repent. That's why we need to change our mind, turn away from our sin and turn to him. Jesus was not calling us to a resolution. He was calling us to a revolution. He was not speaking of reformation or renovation. He was talking of transformation. And that's what happens. And the truth is genuine repentance will lead you to seeking God's truth and applying it in your daily life. And it results in a complete transformation of your life. God calls us first to repentance. And when we turn to him, then he blesses us. So the question has to be amongst us this morning. Do you know the Lord? You see, I came home December 27th. The first thing I did was across the street because I was supposed to get loaded that day. Some friends of mine were receiving a kilo from Thailand and we were going to get high. I went across the street to try and find my friends. They weren't there, so I witnessed what had happened to the mom and a couple of the daughters. Then I came home, and I went into my parents' den where mom and dad and my two sisters were. And I said, Mom, Dad, Becky, Madeline, I love you. Praise the Lord. Madeline came and asked me, what happened to you? My mother went to do a rosary for me because she thought I was crazy. <laughs> True story. She went to the, her room to do a rosary because she was sure I was crazy. And uh, my sister Madeline went to bed that night, and she said to Jesus, whatever you did for him, please do it for me. She got saved. Two or three weeks later, I'm reading the Bible. I walk into my parents' kitchen where they were seated. I open the Bible. I hold it in my hand. This is the word of God, I said. And I read Revelation 9, and I said, Dad, I don't understand what this means, but I do know this. It's not speaking to me. It's talking to you. And I said, Daddy, you're a good man. You are the best man I'll ever know. But you will be the best man in hell if you don't give your heart to Jesus Christ. I said, Daddy, I love you. And I don't want to go to heaven without you. Bow your head. You're receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior right now. And that's how my mom and dad got saved. Then I kept praying for my brother. My brother got saved August 4th, 1974. And then I started a home Bible study here in Ontario. And a young woman named Marie Lopez showed up. She gave her heart to Jesus Christ in my Bible studies. And she needed discipling so much, I married her. And I've been with her for many years now. My sister Rebecca went into a, a homosexual lifestyle and remained in it. She says something like 27 years. But in 1998, 99, I gave an invitation, and my sister Becky committed her heart to Jesus Christ, walked away from lesbianism, never has returned, and is serving the Lord to this day. My God changes lives. My God transforms. My God forgives. My God renews. And it all comes by the word of God. It is true. Speak it with certainty. Speak it with conviction. Speak it with love, but speak it. And watch what happens when people hear that God loves them. He sent his son Jesus to die for them, and he can forgive you of any sin and every sin if you come to him and ask. He can, he will, and he transforms. I am living proof of what God can do from the gutter to glory. That's what God can do in a person's life. I believe it with all of my heart.